Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about prosperity, but perhaps not from the approach that most people have typically been seeing in the theaters, reading in magazines, or perhaps grazing through in newspapers. On the program today, we're going to be going back to the teachings of Jesus and Buddha, who had a wonderful parallel when they were talking about prosperity and the way that we should begin to understand it. On the program today, we're going to be joined with Janet Connor. She is a vibrant writer, speaker, and teacher who became a catalyst for deep soul change after a series of personal traumas. Her landmark book, Writing Down Your Soul, 2009, connects readers to their extraordinary voice within. Joining us here, she's going to be talking about her newest book, The Lotus and the Lily. We're going to be cracking the abundance code by linking the wisdom of your inner voice. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Ms. Janet Connor. Janet, thank, thank you. you for joining us here on the program today. I'm delighted. I'm speaking to you from Florida. Oh, across well, how about the that? Country. Any hurricanes going on in that no, side? No, it's or? nice and quiet. No, the hurricanes are in New York. Well, no, I understand that. But, you know, Florida's <laughs> had their share as well. And, of course, yeah. you know, everybody seems to bounce back with a particular resilience, but, uh, you know, I noticed that you were on Martha Stewart's Whole Living. What a place to actually present your work with somebody who really understands the law of prosperity and abundance, huh? It, it, all of these invitations, they they come in a very unique way, not because I put anything I want on a vision board, you know, the standard traditional law of attraction way of doing things. Right. Instead, I focus on living in such a way that I know that I am turning myself into the fertile soil in which anything can grow, Mm -hmm. anything that matches my soul's purpose Mm -hmm. can grow. And so these invitations just come. Oh. Like like you, you know, right. that, that I get an email and, you know, please come and speak and please come and write an article. And my job, Daniel, is to say yes. Now, it's interesting because you talk about prosperity there as, you know, these vision boards. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, for instance, the movie The Secret, which oh, yeah. on this program I've been known to sort of bad mouth a little bit. In fact, <laughs> I even had co-producers of that very movie on the program that said, yeah, we kind of felt the same way you do, you know, and I was like, okay, well, at least, you know, not that it didn't have anything of value, but I just kind of felt like it gave the impression to people you could just sit around and intend all day long, you know, and and everything's just going to come to you, and I'm like, no, there's action, you have to act toward that, as they say, take a single step, I believe it is, and God right. takes a thousand steps toward right. you, you know, yeah. but you've got to take that step. But talk about how this book came about and what was going on in your life that kind of changed the, your perception of prosperity and the law of attraction mm-hmm. and all of that. Well, I was doing what everybody was doing. I, to, I had watched The Secret, and even though my stomach said, gosh, this looks like materialism, camouflaged as spirituality, it was so big that, okay, everybody's playing this game, I'll play too. And I had the same books in my shelves that everybody else has. And I was saying my affirmations, visualizing what I wanted, getting very clear about what I wanted and asking for it. All of the standard uh, lumped under this umbrella, the law of attraction. Well, Writing Down Your Soul, my first book, had come out at the beginning of '09. And I told you my job is to say yes. And so any church or bookstore that invited me to speak anywhere in the country, I would go. And this was a very lovely thing. I taught thousands and thousands of people how to take their writing practice way beyond journaling, way beyond journaling and into divine dialogue. Every single day I got these gorgeous emails. Your books changed my life. But there was one problem. I funded all those trips on my already very heavily burdened credit cards by November, because this is sort of the new writer reality. People say, well, are you going on a book tour? (laughs) Ah. Oh, sure, if you're John Gresham, you know, but no, um, the burden for getting out there and meeting your readers sits, you know, 95% on the writer's shoulders. And I was happy 
to go to. I, I was I was in Portland a couple of years ago. I went to Tennessee. I went to Massachusetts. You name it, I went. But by that Thanksgiving, exactly now, uh, in '09, I just had to face this painful reality. And it seemed so unfair because I was doing all of the things that all of the books and even all of our spiritual centers tell us to do. So why in the world was I going bankrupt? Well, my son was home from college for Christmas, uh, for Thanksgiving, and I did one of the hardest things I've ever done. I had to look him in the eye and say, your mother is bankrupt. Mm-hmm. And bless him, he looked right back, and he asked me one question. He said, Mom, are you doing work you love? I said, well, yeah. And then, uh, out of the wisdom of a 21-year-old, 19-year-old, he said, so what's the problem? You're bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Half of America is bankrupt. Call Mm -hmm. a bankruptcy attorney. And it felt like this enormous weight, the the shame of it just dissolved. So I called a bankruptcy attorney, but so did, you know, hundreds and thousands of other people. It was oh nine, the height of our global meltdown. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, I can see you in February. February. Now it's Thanksgiving. So I picked up a pen. This is how I live my life. And I had a conversation with my divine voice. I write to dear God, but I write very quickly, and dear God becomes DG. So DG and I had a long, long chat. And I asked, I think the questions anybody would ask, you know, what is this all about? Was there a blessing in bankruptcy? What am I supposed to be seeing that I'm not seeing? And then I got a little annoyed. (laughs) And in big black letters I said, and furthermore, what am I supposed to do between now and February? Now, in Portland, you have a lot of deep soul writers writing down your soul has been a bestseller at New Renaissance Bookstore for years. So maybe a lot of our listeners will know what I'm talking about. When you are not journaling, but engaging in deep soul writing, Mm -hmm. and you ask for divine guidance, you will get divine guidance. So I got this, I, I thought, both very sensible and very strange guidance. I was told to write, deep soul write, at the very deepest level, every single day of December of 2009. That didn't surprise me. I mean, this is how I live my life. But what surprised me was that I was told what to write about. And that has never happened to me before. Mm -hmm. For one week, I was to only spend the whole seven days in preparation. Well, this seemed pretty stupid to me. Why, why, Why do I have to prepare I have a pretty profound deep soul writing practice and a prayer practice. Let's get to the creating the new year. But the guidance said, oh, no, 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 no. If you will please look at all spiritual traditions, there is always, always a period of preparation before the feast, before the celebration, before the Easter, before the Christmas. Look at Ramadan. You fast for an entire month for having sex. And, and so then I couldn't the argue. Sowing before the reaping. <laughs> always, always. But we materialistically, and this is my, and I, and I sense your issue with what we lump under the law of attraction is we want it now, we want it fast, and we want it to be stuff. Uh huh. And that's not the teaching of the great masters. So. The second week I was to look back at the life I had already created. The third week I was to do nothing but release and forgive. And finally, finally in the fourth week, I could begin to get a peek into the future I was now going to be ready to create. And and I must say that the guidance, once I got to the fourth week, did make really, really, really good sense. There is a great logic in a week of preparation, a week of looking back and finding all the gifts in the life you've already created really understanding what, you, what you've already created. And there is nothing richer than a week of forgiveness. Because mm-hmm. I just let go untied all kinds of cruddy little old 
angers, resentments, stories. And finally, I was an empty vessel in which my new life could grow. And so what I found I wanted in that fourth week was radically different, radically different from what I might have said I wanted if we had skipped those three weeks of preparation, looking back and forgiving and just said, hey, what do I want? Mm -hmm. Which is the law of attraction kind of the secret way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So after all this preparation, on January 1st, I leapt out of bed. I was just on fire. I was so sure that I was ready to call in a magical, beautiful 2010. But the strangest thing happened. Instead of picking up my journal and engaging in the practice I always do on January 1st, I call it a soul day, but just think of it as a personal retreat. You and your divine voice partner are just going to spend a half a day or a day together. It's a very rich practice. It doesn't have to just be on January 1st, but I do always do it on January 1st. But I didn't. I didn't pick up a pen. Instead, <clears throat> today I can... <clears throat> say that this is, forgive me, hold on a second. <coughs> I got my throat coat tea. I was just in um, Austin, Texas, speaking at six events in six days. Ah. And I've got the Bill Clinton voice going on here. Gotcha. <laughs> where it just won't, <laughs> it just won't go anymore. So I'm resting it and getting ready to come out and see all of you in Portland. Mm. So I pick up, instead of doing my writing, I pick up You Are Here by Thich Nhat Hanh. Anybody who's read Thich Nhat Hanh knows what's about to happen, but I had never read him before. And so I, I said, well, gee, I have all day to do my deep soul writing. I'm thoroughly prepared. So I'm just going to read one chapter, get a taste for Thich Nhat Hanh and the Buddha's teaching. Well, you, you can't read one chapter of Thich Nhat Hanh. He writes so smoothly, so elegantly, so sweetly, so kindly, you'd swear he's sitting in the room across from you, mm -hmm. speaking to you. So, but it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm still reading. And this, of course, turned out to be divinely orchestrated, absolutely perfect, because I finally stumbled upon the sentence that changed my life, changed 180 degrees my understanding of prosperity, and became the book, The Lotus and the Lily. Well, the, uh, in this chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh is trying to explain to the Western reader that the Buddha's great, 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 great teaching is this is because that is. Now I'm sitting here scratching my head. I don't get it. And he understands that a Westerner raised in duality doesn't get it. So he tells a simple, simple, simple story to try to illustrate it. And it was exactly what I needed. If Without that little story, I would have glossed right over this is because that is. Mm -hmm. Well, he says he, lives, he was exiled from Vietnam back during the Vietnam War, and he lives in southern France where they have real winter. And he says, if I... In the middle of winter, look out the window, do I see sunflowers? Now, sitting in my little house in Florida, I know that Thich Nhat Hanh does not see sunflowers in France in winter. So he says, does that mean the sunflowers are dead? No, it means the conditions aren't right. Mm -hmm. When the day is longer and the sun is higher and the temperature is warmer, bingo, sunflowers. He wraps up this simple little story with this sentence. When conditions are sufficient, there is a manifestation. I leapt out of my chair like a rocket. I raced around this room screaming, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Here I am wanting to create, to manifest a beautiful life. And everything, everything we think we know about manifestation is 180 degrees off. It is a formula, but mm -hmm. it's not the manifestation. It's about the conditions. If you'll just focus on living your conditions, then your sunflowers, so to speak, simply must grow. 
Mm-hmm. But we've got it ass backwards. Right. Because we're so materialistic and so worried. And the, and the worse the global meltdown got, the more we fell into, well, you know, I've just got to ask for a job, ask for a car, ask for a house, ask for this, ask for that, ask for this. And clearly, if asking worked, if the law of attraction as it is taught worked, we wouldn't all be in this pickle. Right. So something was wrong. So I thought it was adorable that here I am reading the Buddha 2,600 years ago, and he got it down to the simplest formula when conditions are sufficient. There is. There has to be Mm -hmm. a manifestation. So I was pretty excited about this, but I did do one of those V8 commercials to the forehead thing because I had, this was the first book on Buddhism I had read. You know, my knowledge, I've studied it, um, and particularly the parallel teachings between Jesus and Buddha at length since then. But this was a wake-up call to me. It was new to me. And so before I wanted to throw my whole life into the Buddhist teaching, I thought, well, what did Jesus say? I I grew up Roman Catholic. I'm not a Catholic Mm -hmm. now, but I do have a very strong Christian education, grade school, college. So I got out this little black book called Blessings of the Cosmos. I wanted to know what is the accurate translation of what we read. Everybody, whether you were raised Christian or not, has heard this phrase, seek first the kingdom and God's righteousness and all else shall be provided. Right. And I thought, well, that kind of, sort of, you know, I mean, it's a formula. It's got two parts, seek first the kingdom, all else shall be provided. Maybe that's kind of, sort of like when conditions are sufficient, there is a manifestation. But the problem is, that everything we read in an English Bible was translated from the Latin, which was translated from the Greek. You know, <laughs> And you know what happens if I just give you one Spanish sentence and you translate it right. into English. Boom. Now mm-hmm. try to imagine what's been lost along the way. And to begin with, Jesus spoke Aramaic, a Middle Eastern language, which has not just the literal meaning. Our English and Greek are very literal languages. But Aramaic, Arabic, several of those Middle Eastern languages, they carry the words and the idioms and the phrases carry not just the literal meaning, but also metaphorical and mystical. Mm -hmm. So a first century listener sitting on a hillside, listening to this outrageous Jewish rabbi, teacher, right? They're not hearing, seek first the kingdom and all else shall be provided. They're hearing more. And so you can't translate it into just a sentence. And for that, I always go to Neil Douglas Cloth. Neil Douglas Cloth has been studying what Jesus said in Aramaic for 30 years. Maybe Mm -hmm. you're familiar. Have you ever seen, Daniel, one of his first books? It's called Prayers of the Cosmos. No, I don't believe I've actually heard that particular name. Neil Douglas Cloth. Okay. He's written six, seven books, The Hidden Gospels, Prayers of the Cosmos. Now, maybe you're familiar with, and I do love, Dr. Rocco Errico's research. That one, no, I'm not familiar with. George, he studied with George Lamsa, and George Lamsa um, found, he is a Middle Easterner, he has uh, passed, but he wrote a holy Bible, and I quote it often in The Lotus and the Lily, that (coughs) attempts while staying within kind of a sentence-to-sentence construct, attempts to restore the idioms Mm -hmm. and the cultural references. He found 12,000 errors in the King James in in a standard English Bible. Right. But Neil, I'm particularly enamored of because he tries. I mean, we don't have a tape recording of anything Jesus said, so... You know, it's just research. It's the best we can do to try to understand what a first century listener heard. So for this sentence, Seek First the Kingdom, he gives a page and a half of poetry. 
And with his permission, the entire page and a half is in the lotus and the lily. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to keep you on the phone and read you the whole page and a half right now. I'm just going to read you the summary. And I have it at the very, very front of the lotus and the lily when it says, Meet the Master. This is, just as Thich Nhat Hanh's summary of this is, because that is, ended up being, when conditions are sufficient, there is a manifestation. This is Neil Douglas Klotz's summary of the page and a half explanation of Seek First the Kingdom. I'm going to read it to you verbatim. Here Jesus says that when we pursue a right relationship with the universal one and allow this relationship to realign our lives, Now stop right there and try to contrast that with the law of attraction, which is get clear about what you want, focus on what you want, and ask for what you want. Nowhere in there. That's about aligning yourself with the divine. Mm -hmm. Well, then here's the rest of it. We produce a condition of receptivity. What are the chances that Thich Nhat Hanh's word, when conditions are sufficient, would also be in this explanation of what Jesus said. We produce a condition of receptivity in which anything we need to help us complete our purpose in life will. That's a promise. Will Mm -hmm. be supplied by the universe. So now at this point it was probably 7 o'clock at night and I grabbed a piece of paper, perfectly plain, 11 by 17, just a vanilla piece of paper, I traced a dinner plate to make a mandala. And then I traced a salad plate on the inside to make the inner circle. And I wanted to draw my conditions. Now, my conditions came in deep soul writing. I've now taught this process to hundreds and hundreds of people. There's a course that uh, the load, I teach it every year in November and December so people can make their intention mandalas for the new year. And it just opened this past Monday. Mm-hmm. So if any of your listeners, it's not too late. If they wanted to sign up for the course, just go to my website, com and click on the Lotus and the Lily Telecourse. Mm-hmm. Well, so I made this real simple intention mandala with my condition. Every single person, I have never seen any two people have the same conditions because no two people are creating the same life. And it does make perfect sense. And some people have four and some people have eight. I have six. And mine, and they're in the book, are I live in intention. I say my prayers out loud. I work in sacred space. I do my holy work. I focus only on what's coming in. And I have a grateful, grateful heart. So Mm -hmm. I drew a lily. It has six petals. I have six. Uh, conditions, and I like it because it reminds me of that beautiful, beautiful saying when people were asking Jesus, how are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? And he said, consider the lilies. They do not toil nor spin. I think anybody, regardless of the tradition they were raised in, has heard that sweet uh, saying too. So I've always kept lilies on my altar. Mm -hmm. So I drew this little lily in the middle. Now, on the outside if you want to visualize my little intention mandala as a clock where the numbers would be, I did put the things I wanted. I wanted my perfect agent in 2010. And all the way around, I put 12 things. I figured I was replicating the clock, so I put 12 things that I wanted. But then, the next morning, January 2nd, and every morning for the rest of my life since, I stand in front of it. I make a new one every year. I stand in front of it, and I say my prayers out loud. That's one of my conditions. And I say to God, okay, here's the deal. You know what I want. You know what I need. You know things I don't even know I need. So I'm just going to hand that over to you. And I am just going to focus on my half of the equation, which is the condition. And then I sing them, I renew them, and then I do them. You know, this isn't just a prayer practice, like, rote. You know, like as a kid growing up, a uh, Catholic, I said the rosary, but I'm ashamed to tell you how I said it, you know. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you, blessed are thou, one woman, the best part of the truth. 
you know, I wasn't paying an ounce of attention. I was just getting through it. Well, this prayer practice, you bring it to life. As that quote said from Jesus, you align yourself in relationship with the universal one. So I do these six things every day. Mm-hmm. Well, January of 2010 was an, uh, a miraculous month. Everywhere I went, people left me huge love offerings. My events were packed. People double registered for my courses and asked me to give the second registration away. I went to my mailbox, and there would be tithes and cash and letters. So this is the way January was. I kept saying yes. I kept showing up. I kept schlepping around the country. Uh, But it seemed to be a little more lucrative. Mm -hmm. So finally, it's February, and it's time to go see the bankruptcy attorney. So I go. I keep my appointment. And he explains the whole process. And then he asks me if I have a question. I said, yes, I do. I have one question. I made $12,000 in January. Is that a problem? And he sighed, and he closed my file, (laughs) and he started to stand up, and I'm just sitting there looking at him, a great big tall guy, like, what are you doing up there? And he smiled, and he said, it's a problem. You're not bankrupt. Come back when you're bankrupt. And of course, I haven't been back. Oh. So then people said, well, you know, show us. How do you do this? And so that's what the lotus and the lily is. It is those same four weeks of deep soul writing, a week of preparation, a week of Looking back, a week of releasing, letting go, and forgiving to create space for the new, and then finally a week of looking forward. Then on the 29th day, you prepare for your soul day. You gather your books and your paper and your colored pencils and whatever, however you're going to make it. And then finally, on the 30th day, not that you have to do it, you know, especially now with the holidays, people need to, you know, skip a day. <clears throat> We're busy, and that's fine. You know, but, but don't skip. The only thing I admonish people is don't pick up this book and go to day 30 and make your intention mandala mm-hmm. because you will not be creating a new and beautiful and abundant life. You'll be creating the life, recreating the life you already have because you don't have new spiritual wisdom. Right. So um, I've now taught this to probably should add it up, many, many hundreds of people. And the story, never mind my story, my story pales in comparison to the outrageous, glorious things that happen when people do what Neil Douglas Claude says Jesus is saying. Don't worry about the stuff. You just align yourself in right relationship with the divine. You just take care of that. Or as Buddha would say, the condition, you just take care of that. And then the universe cannot help but provide because you've created in yourself this fertile soil. I think of myself as black loam, you know, just the best possible composted soil a farmer could create. Mm -hmm. And then stuff grows. Um, Here's a, when people say, does this really work? It just happened two weeks ago. Three weeks ago? Yeah. I got a phone call out of the blue from Unity Online Radio. They, I mean, you could say asking, but basically it was telling me that I am going to be a radio show host starting in January. <laughs> and, and, and I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled. What a lovely way. To reach people around the world without getting on an airplane. I'm thrilled. But I must confess, I, wh- wh- after I hung up the phone, I, stood and I looked at my intention mandala, and I said, excuse me, but where on here does it say radio show? Because I don't put, and I don't do that rectangular vision board where you put on the pictures of the things you want. I don't. In fact, this year, my intention mandala has no thing, nothing 
Mm-hmm. It just has, I want a full cup of joy, a full cup of fertility to produce my work, my books, my classes. And it does say a full cup of influence, to influence as many people as possible. Now, that one, the radio show, I, I, nowhere. I have, I've never said in my deep soul writing, I never prayers, I never said, hey, I want to be a radio show host. But now, of course, I see that it's an absolutely perfect way to fulfill my soul purpose. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely sold. There is no power on heaven or earth that could get me to go back to the law of attraction way of doing things. Mm-hmm. And to help people with that, there's a chart on in the welcome section of the book now, it's Roman numerals, so you have to go back to fourth grade. X, V, I. <laughs> gotcha. 16. But there's a very, very simple chart, and I can just go over it verbally for the listeners, comparing and contrasting the law of attraction as we materialistically apply it and the lotus and the lily, the teaching of Buddha and Jesus. In the law of attraction method, the human is at the center because it's all about what you want. It starts from you. The energy comes from you. But, of course, the lotus and the lily of the divine is at the center, and that's why we make an intention mandala. The mandala is the perfect illustration of the connection of the human and the divine. There is no better. And every single spiritual tradition uses the mandala to try to convey this connection of the human and the divine, like the medicine wheel in the Native American tradition, mm-hmm. the labyrinth on the floor of Chart Cathedral, uh, the yin-yang symbol. And I, I, I'm no uh, expert on mandalas, but I did a lot of research, and so I wrote a chapter, What is the Mandala and Why Do We Make It? Because I think that would excite the reader to say, oh, I get it, yeah, this is why we're not making a rectangular vision board, it's A, too materialistic, and it's not the power shape. The number one shape in sacred geometry is the circle. Mm -hmm. And I got a a confirmation of this this past summer. Every year I take a small group of deep soul writers, people who have taken my courses, read my book, somewhere. We've been to Oaxaca, Mexico, Costa Rica, this past July, we went to the Blacktail Ranch in Montana. Now, that's sacred Native American land with an ancient medicine wheel. Mm. And so I reread Black Elk Speaks five times, you know, trying to, it's, it's like a Bible. You know, you've got to read it slowly and let it sink in. And I reread Sun Bear. You know, I spent a lot of time. Not that I could ever, you know, become an expert on the medicine wheel, but just enough to be able to give the travelers a sense of the beauty and the importance of what they were seeing on this hillside. Well, Black Elk, after he um, got stuck in a Pine Ridge reservation in a hut, he writes about this, or I shouldn't say he writes, he spoke, and then... Uh, what he said was captured and translated into English. But he said, there is no power in a square. And and, and it, it was killing him that he was forced to live in a rectangular square room, hut. And then he goes on to say, everything the Native American does is a hoop, is a circle. The prayers, the Native Americans always pray to the seven directions, creating a three-dimensional globe, a circle, a mandala. Their homes were teepees, were circles. I thought this was an incredible sentence. There is no power in a square. And then I laughed, thinking back to all those square and rectangular vision boards I'd made. And I, and I must confess, I think I made them for four years. And... They didn't come to pass. They didn't. 
And then I'd be frustrated at the end of the year and say, well, okay, that didn't happen and that didn't happen and that didn't happen and that didn't happen. So it made me laugh to read that Black Elk said, well, of course it didn't happen, Janet. There is no power in a square. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The mandala is a very magical, very magical. It's mystical. It's ancient. And our uh, current ability to sort of dig into the quantum physics shows that the mandala really is an engine of change. Jung, I, I, he wrote five books on mandalas. The guy was obsessed with mandalas. He had his patients make them. He made one every day. And he said repeatedly that you become the mandala. The mandala draws you unconsciously and magically. He used that term magical several times. You simply become what you have drawn. Well, he didn't have access to the information about quantum physics. Mm -hmm. Today, quantum physics can prove, can show, oh, yeah, this is how it actually does draw you as an engine of change to become what you have drawn. But keep in mind now, it's your relationship with spirit, your commitments to yourself, your soul, and your God that are at the center. That's why it has such beautiful power. You have the divine at the center. So I digressed here. I'm back to my chart. <laughs> That's okay. You see, listeners, we knew if we allowed her to talk long enough, we would be in directions we would have never even fathomed before. Right. So I thought I would jump in and take over for just a little bit okay. and see where it leads us. Now, when we go back, for instance, as you were talking about uh, Buddha, you were reading Thich Nhat Hanh, and he mm-hmm. was simply saying, basically, it is cause and effect, okay? And people say, well, okay, I kind of get that, but how does that apply to the fact that perhaps I've lost my home? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that was the government's fault. You know, it was because of their mishandling of money that that's happened to me. So my first question would be, well, how many people do you know who haven't lost their homes? you know, who are doing pretty well okay. I mean, there are a lot of those people out there. The problem is is that the news tends to focus on the negative things, and if anybody yeah. really follows the history of journalism, especially when it comes to propaganda, for instance, mm-hmm. which was created uh, by Edward Bernays, actually, in the early part of the 1900s, the idea is that they're steering people to take particular yeah. actions they know yeah. they can count on. What we're talking about here is a liberation of the individual to understand that that what when we talk about spirit, it is beyond all of this nonsense that people, all the suffering that these people have. You know, the suffering, in other words, is a way of saying this is how they can tame or, let's say, discipline the masses from making probably dumb decisions in the first place. Who knows? Right. But that being said... When we get and we take a look at cause and effect, let's say that you are one of these uh, people who are listening today who says, well, the law of attraction, most people want to attract money. So you sit there and you do your meditations. You have your vision board about you know what you're going to do with all this money. And you're all excited about it. You're all enthused about it. And then you plug in an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, for instance. Pay attention to what you're thinking and feeling as you're watching these people. And you'll know exactly what you have inside of yourself that you really need to work on and why that attraction isn't occurring. And this is a lot of what Jesus was also talking about as well, is when you say fertile ground, you've got to be in a position that you have just as much gratitude for Mm -hmm. another's miracles as you have for the gratitude when yours manifests. So that when you talk about forgiveness and the forgiving and all that sort of a thing, you realize there's some real work, some real toiling of the soil, if you will. And so tell us about that with you and how that changed uh, compared to the way you were doing things before. Well, if it wasn't for the the divine guidance to write every day in the month of December at Mm -hmm. such a deep level, I wouldn't have stepped away from those traditional meditate on what you want, see it coming Mm -hmm. um, practices because there was no other substitute. Now you couldn't get me to do any, any of those. And let me um, give you just one 
story. I think this will get through to your listeners because if you simply say, well, don't do that, create an intention mandala, the the seeding, the ground in which this spiritual practice, this relationship with the divine grows isn't clear. So here's my, off the chart, even I think this story is unbelievable. The, one of the first times I was teaching the lotus and the lily, I saw that there was a woman, a friend with me on Facebook, who was in dire, dire, dire straits. And the deal I have with God is I give away. I, at this point, I've given away $28,000 in tuition to my courses. It's mm-hmm. just what I do. So I sent her a little side email and said, hey, you know, this course is starting. If you'd like to come, I'd be happy to give it to you. I'd love to give it to you. So she came, and on opening night, we were small enough then that everybody could tell their story. Now there's 77 people in the class, so um, we share our stories in the private Facebook discussion groups as opposed to uh, while we're live on the phone. Well, so she told the story that she was a writer, and she had broken her foot. It wasn't healing. All of her clients disappeared overnight, all of them. So she had no income. She was facing bankruptcy because of these medical expenses. She was in pain. And she had just begun to sell her grandmother's jewelry for groceries. Mm. Now, i got to tell you, when I heard that, I thought, oh, my God, you know, can this be turned around in 30 days? Okay, Lord, here we go. (laughs) And so I simply teach the process as I teach it, and now it's right there in the book. Anybody can follow the first 28 days of Deep Soul Writing. When she got to the section on forgiveness that third week, she realized, holy schmazzoli, it's going to take more than a week to clean out. She did a meditation and saw that there were 75 people she was angry with Mm -hmm. in her dungeon. So she began a very intense, very, very deep forgiveness practice. And she realized as the course was coming to an end that until she could put her father's picture on her altar, she couldn't have a beautiful life. And he had, you know, she never went into the gory details, but it sounded like he was about as bad a father as a person can have. Mm-hmm. So we, we, we go through this process for 30 days. We meet afterwards. When I say meet, it's on the telephone. And we share our intention mandalas. We pass pictures around. But then we get together 30 days later. Because remember in my story, 30 days later, I was no longer bankrupt. It worked Mm -hmm. awfully, awfully fast. Right. So we get together 30 days later, and she told, even I cannot just take in the the story that she told. Number one, her foot was healing. Number two, she now had more writing clients than she could handle, and she was giving them away, giving assignments away to friends. Mm-hmm. Number three, out of the blue, wasn't even on her radar screen. She got a phone call inviting her to par- to participate in a beautiful old building that had been restored, and they wanted to give her a writing office rent-free. Wow. Number four, she was accepted into a very prestigious MFA program that she had wanted for years to get into. Okay, that's all pretty exciting, right? Right. Wait till you hear number five, out of the blue. She got a phone call from her father, Mm. and her father said, I've heard through the grapevine that you got into that MFA program, and I would like to pay for it. Wow. This is a man who had never given anyone, not his children, not anyone. She said he's the ultimate original Scrooge. Now, how is that possible, Daniel? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you stick to the regular law of attraction, do your meditation, visualize it coming in. Some I'm, of it may come here and there, but But I like agree. that? Mm-hmm. That's a complete and utter transformation. This is the power of the divine. This mm-hmm. is the power of the quantum field. This is the power of shifting your attention away from mm-hmm. what you want and onto how am I going to live? 
by becoming the queen of forgiveness, mm-hmm. that woman has. She, I'm still in close touch with her, and she's always the guest expert on forgiveness. She comes to all of our courses and tells her stories, and she keeps us up to date. The, maybe the most miraculous thing, because it's now been three years, mm-hmm. is she said her father hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. He is about the most difficult man on the planet. But she said now her ability to love him has nothing to do with his behavior. Right. She said forgiveness opens the space for love. And man, when you're full of love, how can you not have a beautiful, abundant life? Right. So it's just a completely different, it's a 180-degree shift. Mm Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's just, it's such fascinating work to consider what you're presenting to the world. Uh, it was back in August of this year that I first came across uh, one particular book that led me into a different direction uh, and to a lot of things, um, and that is, it was through, I think it was called Simple Abundance. Oh, yeah. And I just happened to turn, my wife's had this book for years and from time to time, but this particular day i actually i think i went back a day just to be sure you know because from time to time i'll pop it open and what i found interesting about this this book is that you can kind of put it away for a while then you go and you pick it up on the day and you'll realize wow you know that's kind of appealing to i guess the message i was interested in that day but on this particular day it opened me up to uh, a book i'd never heard of before called the power of the subconscious mind by joseph murphy And so as I looked that up, of course, the library's got a copy of it, and then it showed him listed in another book called The Prosperity Bible. Now, this is a fascinating book by itself because it brings together the collective writings of what was known as the New Thought uh, Mm -hmm, Movement mm -hmm. of the early part or late part Mm -hmm. of the 1800s. So for the listeners out there, uh, you had the likes of Napoleon Hill, which everybody's heard of his book, but then you had uh, the power of the subconscious. Then there was another one um, uh, whom I have, a uh, Florence Scovel Shin, oh, who wrote yeah. a book called, uh, you know, game the game of life and how to play it. And you read this, and what you read it in the Prosperity Bible, which I think would be one everybody should have by their bedside, because it really talks about prosperity. Now, money can be a part of that game. Wealth can certainly be a part of that mm-hmm. game. But what they're talking about in prosperity is that you prosper in everything you could ever desire and imagine, everything. And money, you know, of course, a lot of people think, well, if I had more money, I would be happier. Okay, well, let's take a look at this for a minute. Mm -hmm. What would money bring for you that would make your life happy? Those are the things to work on. Yes. Then the money does come, you know. You've just. Um, that's one of the exercises in the Lotus and the Lily. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants money. You don't want the money. You no. want the the ability to pay for your child's tuition. You or want you want the ability. ability to feel secure in knowing that yeah. perhaps the electricity is going to stay on, food's going to stay in the yeah. fridge. But a room and then you full take of money? A, no. Right. And you take a look at those things, but there was one thing I was reading in The Power of the Subconscious Mind that I think also tangles a lot of people up and they don't tend to see, for instance, And that is that he was talking about a miracle where Jesus was doing a healing with someone. Mm -hmm. And as that healing had occurred, he says, now that you were healed, stay quiet about it. Don't even talk to anybody about it, Mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And what was said was, made so much sense, I thought, wow, how come Christians aren't teaching this stuff? And that is, the reason is, because people will come and they will say, oh, that's not possible, and they'll start throwing doubts in Mm -hmm. to the fact that you've experienced a miracle, and that could actually cancel out the miracle itself. And I thought, you know, think of people, for instance, who go to start a business. They go and they tell their parents and their, you know, their close-knit community, we want to do that for, you know, uh, Within five years, 95% of businesses fail. So here you got this conviction you want to start a business, and everybody's throwing in all these seeds of doubt, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, throwing the wrench into the machine or, or whatever it is. And and I realized, you know, there is such power that, you know, for instance, you're out there, maybe your New Year's resolution, like it seems like a lot of people, you want to lose weight. So you're on there and you're doing your thing, and then pretty soon people, of course, in earnest are saying, so how's that diet going for you? Mm-hmm. 
well, you've got your own little judgment going on just by receiving the way they've said that. And eventually you find yourself off the wagon, and before you know it, you're back to what you were doing before. Just simply do. Stay quiet. Just simply do these things. And allow people to finally say, hey, what are you doing differently? Well, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of made a couple of changes, nothing specific. Wow. <laughs> you know? and so there's a lot of power in a lot of that stuff. And so you can see how the lotus and the lily, what you're talking about, which I would love to have the opportunity to read because what I was told by the producer about this, I got pretty excited. I said, I'd love to read this book because of what I was reading and where I was at then. And, uh, you know, and... It's just it's it's really amazing stuff when you a you start to get it and b you do live more in the moment. Yeah. It it changes the way you live. It changes the way you pray. It changes what matters, and it really opens you up to there. And real, there is no other word for it but miracles. For example, in my first um, intention mandala, I wrote, "My son is safe." free and loved he was going through a very traumatic time period so i thought well i'm, I'm going to put this in and i drew a little yellow road and little stick figures so there he is walking down his little yellow road the following thanksgiving he didn't come home i could see it was him in caller id i pick up the phone i can't even get hey babe out of my mouth and he's screaming i'm safe i'm safe i'm safe i'm safe I said, what? The apartment burned down. Mm -hmm. Not a hair of his head, not one thing he owns, not his computer, not his artwork, not his books, nothing. Whereas apartments all around and other people within that apartment, their stuff got ruined. I went back to that intention mandala and just think, I put my son is safe, free, and loved. I had no conscious intention, that that meant safe if the place burns down. <laughs> no, that, that, that is abs- and the, things like this happen to me all the time, and not just mm-hmm. to me, but to people in the courses. If we will just let go of this desperate attempt to tell the universe what you need and to make it look, I want that house, I want that car, I want that relationship, I want that job, stop it already. Mm-hmm. The universe knows Far, far better, far, far better than you ever could what your beautiful, abundant life could look like. I keep remembering, Janet, uh, there was a tape series I was listening to, Marianne Williamson, Mm -hmm. and she would talk about A Course in Miracles from time to time. and, Mm -hmm. And it led me to, and this was a long time ago before I began radio, and that is, that she talked about, you know, just think about it. You took this little bitty part on Hill Street Blues, and the universe kept waiting because it had something much bigger than that for you, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the law of attraction in action, folks, because it attracts to you whatever you want. And then a lot of times for people, that may not be what they want. Mm -hmm. So there I was at this job, and I kept thinking about that. I kept thinking, you know, here I am taking this little bitty part, the Hill Street Blues, when the universe had something bigger. And eventually the day came that I was pulled in and I was terminated from the job. And what was funny about that is I kind of laughed. And I was asked, well, what's so funny about that? I said, well, apparently I've been intending to lose this job because it's been happening for about a year now. And I wanted to thank you for doing that for me because I was apparently unable to do it for myself. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, the whole time I've been realizing that I've been playing small here, that I've been listening to the likes of someone like you and, you know, working in this environment and saying, you know, here I am taking this little bitty part on Hill Street Blues and the universe has something bigger. And I want to thank you for releasing me, for, mm-hmm. for, for doing something I, I didn't want to do for myself. Now I'm ready to accept that bigger part. <laughs> now, most people would look at that, but you lost your job and your source of income. But see, that's where trust and allowing have yeah. to come in. And faith, and that is one of the biggest foundations that a person needs to understand about what we're talking about here today. You have to bathe in faith. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's not easy to do. 
Well, and that's where the this process gives you kind of a grounding. Uh, you, you do have something to do. You have mm-hmm. these four weeks of writing. You have this intention mandala practice. You have your soul day. And so it it helps you show up every day with something to do. Right. And then... And and but it but while you're doing that, it's reminding you let go, let go, mm-hmm. let go. You're not in charge of attracting. It doesn't have to come out of your mind. Mm-hmm. You just create in yourself the beautiful relationship with the divine. You just become that fertile soil and just stand back. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what has happened to me and to people in the. In the lotus and the lily courses, it's a lovely way to live. It sure it's is a because lovely you, way to live. I think it's because you get to enjoy just how mysterious life gets, exactly. <laughs> you, you, and you become a child again. Yeah, yeah, you enter into the mystery, mm-hmm. and in the universe is a mystery. The divine is a mystery, but somehow, instead of that being this scary thing that you have to somehow intellectually understand, because guess what? You can't intellectually understand it. No. Instead of that, you just say, hey, we're a partnership here. Mm -hmm. I'm in a relationship with the divine, and my partner is taking exquisite care of me, and all is well. I was just watching last night a documentary on Michael Jackson and the Bad Album, and by the end of this, he was at a point where he simply says, I'm not the creative process. The creative process is already there. It works through me. The creative process Mm -hmm. is God. Now, are you going to argue with somebody that kept making one album better than the next? (laughs) You know, someone who touched lives to the level that he was able to touch. And the fact that we all have this within us. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every single person is a creative being. Mm-hmm. The soul wants to express itself. One of the stories I tell in The Lotus and the Lily is, wasn't Michael Jackson, and I, and I, I was listening on the radio in the car, and I caught it late, so I don't even know who the rock star was, or I would give the guy the the the, the benefit. But what I heard him say, the interviewer said, so how did you plan your last album. And the rock star raised his voice and cut him off. And he said, you don't plan an album. If you are walking into the studio knowing the music you're going to write, don't walk in the studio. Mm -hmm. And painters know that and writers know that. But somehow the general public, even though every single person on this planet is a creator and is a creative being, Somehow we think that, oh, that's Michael, you know, that's these special people. That's Picasso. But it's simply the way we're wired. Mm-hmm. We're, we are all capable of being one with the creator, one with the one. Our work and our lives are of service to the creative force of the universe. If you'll just do that, how can I serve? In that um, translation that Neil Douglas Klotz gives of Seek First the Kingdom, one line, just one line is pouring yourself out makes the universe do the same. Right. That's what's missing in our materialistic approach to creating a life. It's not about getting clear about what you want. If you'll just pour yourself out to be the human being, embodied soul you're here to be, if you'll just do that, If you'll just be of service, then the universe is not going to let you down. No. Now, Janet, I know that your Soul Directed Life, which is your radio show that will be on Unity FM, Mm -hmm. (coughs) begins on January 3rd, as I understand. But you'll also be in Portland, Oregon at New Renaissance Bookstore. Tell us about that. I um, will be. I'm leaving this coming Wednesday. I love coming to Portland. I'm mm-hmm. very spoiled in Portland because my brother lives in Portland, and uh-huh. so I get to spend some time with family as well. So on Friday night, the 30th, a week from tonight, there is an author talk for The Lotus and the Lily, and I'll be there from 7 to 8.30. Then the next day, 
on Saturday, December the 1st, from 4 to 6, I'm going to teach a compressed two-hour deep dive into writing down your soul. A lot of people in Portland have already been reading that book, already have an active deep soul writing practice. And then, of course, there are people that are discovering me for the first time. But deep soul writing is the foundation of everything. So for two hours, and I think that workshop is only $20. Oh. There's going to be a lovely, deep exploration. And I'll make sure everybody knows how to get into the theta brainwave state. That's how we move beyond journaling. We don't want to be journaling in the alpha brainwave state. We want to get all the way to divine dialogue in the theta brainwave state. So come and play. But why don't you call New Renaissance and make a reservation so I know how many workbooks to bring. <laughs> and then the next day, Sunday, December 2nd, I'm the guest speaker at Unity of Portland at the 9 and the 11, and then teaching a workshop on the Lotus and Lily, Unravel the Great Paradox of Prosperity at 1 o'clock, 1 to 3.30. So lots of fun things in your town. And just to let our listeners know as well that there was a time where miracles were everyday regular occurrences, and we've come to a point to believe that these are rare occurrences that seem to happen to everyone else. The truth is, is miracles occur more regularly than you can ever imagine. The question is, are you ready to be that miracle creator? Because it is very possible. And Buddha and Jesus have shown us the way. Exactly. They gave us the formula. <laughs> they did. So anybody listening, I know that you can be heard around the country, not just in Portland. <clears throat> so everybody, whether you're in Portland or not, um, you can go to my website, Janet Connor, C-O-N-N-E-R dot com, and subscribe to the newsletter, because I do have a lot of events and exciting things coming up. Well, Janet, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. It's the lotus and the lily. Be sure to find out what the great paradox of prosperity is and how you can become beyond that. Thank you again for being on the Beyond thank 50 radio you, program. Thank you, Daniel. It was a lovely, lovely Friday afternoon. Thank you. We also encourage you, the listeners out there, be sure to visit us at our website, which is beyond50radio.blogspot.com as well. We also have a weekly e-newsletter that we'll be producing, and we'll have this great information for you in there as well. Just simply log on, put in your email, and it comes to you for free, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Thank you again for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis, and remember, live your day past.